Hey guys, welcome back to the Kodakin Podcast. Yeah, so this week on the podcast, we talked to Becky, also known as Kapalang on Twitter, and she's a PhD student in Kyoto studying cognitive psychology and has studied Japanese to a very high level. So in the podcast, we talk about her experience to learn Japanese, what she's working on and studying at school, and also her experience learning a bunch of different other languages. But it's that time to go and smash, destroy, obliterate, disintegrate the like button. You know how it is. But before that, you also have to go follow us on Twitter at Raza Talks at Race Away. Let's get it. Yeah. Yeah, so Becky, can you give us a quick background of who you are and where you're at today? Um, so yeah, um, my name is Becky, um, and I'm originally from East London and the UK, um, but I am now currently living in Kyoto. Um, I've been living here for four years now. I'm about to enter my fifth year. Um, I've been learning Japanese for quite a while, and um, I, I generally like languages, um, and not just Japanese, but uh, particularly Asian languages. Um, and uh, I'm actually a, a PhD student at Kyoto University, um, and I hope to, well, I don't know when I'm going to finish, but I, I do hope to finish at some point. <laughs> yeah, so, so is, uh, is Japanese like your main language? You said you learned um, a bunch of different other Asian languages as well? It is my main language. It's the one I'm most proficient in. Um, although it has been quite a rocky journey, it hasn't been the most kind of not really smooth sailing um, through the years that I've been learning it. Um, but it's definitely the one that I've stuck to most. And um, well, I'm here now, so it's um, the one that kind of means the most to me. And what, so, what are you um, studying now with your PhD? Um, so. Japanese unis are a bit weird, actually. You don't have like a PhD in a in a subject. You well, it, I, well, in my in my university, it's not like that. Um, you apply to the graduate school, and then you in the graduate school you have a a, a major, and then you have a like a, a department, and then you get your PhD from that department. So my PhD is, if I go by the department, it's in cog, uh, cognitive psychology in education. So it's kind of like cognitive psychology, but applied to that educational context. Yeah. Okay, so it's not like um, it, is it related to language learning at all? Oh uh, yeah. Or is so, mostly. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking at how foreign language speaking anxiety uh, affects. Well, it's kind of like a, a two-way thing. Um, how like the mechanisms that the cognitive mechanisms that go on your in your brain really when you're feeling anxious speaking in a foreign language. Yeah. Okay. So so like what what kind of theories are there like surrounding that? Um, anxiety and so speaking foreign languages there's not a lot in the in terms of language but when um in a lot of research for like um uh public speaking and social anxiety there's kind of a this issue of like working memory so how much information that you can you can manage at one time and um this is made even more difficult when you're speaking in a foreign language that isn't doesn't come so automatic to you particularly um like japanese students learning english um, they don't have a lot of time, a lot of opportunity to speak in English, so it's not automatic for a lot of people. And then when they have to speak, it it's quite a, it's quite burdensome on um, their thinking. Um, there's also like when you talk to people, is you're you're kind of focusing on what your, yourself is saying and what the other person is doing. So if they're kind of nodding their head, you know you're you're doing a good job. But if they're looking at you like, what? You know that you said something wrong or you're not making sense, and you you have these kind of the two-way it's kind of like a monitoring so it's like a two-way um thought process and all this comes together and then you just your mind goes blank or you start to stir or you you just can't you can't speak your best and um it, I'm, I'm taking these theories from um social anxiety and uh public speaking anxiety and kind of seeing if they work with foreign language speaking anxiety um and I also quite like the brain, so I'll be taking some kind of like brain, um, uh, brain activity measurements and things. So it's all, yeah, it's a bit fun. <laughs> yeah. So you're telling me, Becky, that if Japanese people aren't nodding when you're talking to them, you can tell before you get jozued. Like there, there's a there's a moment where you can see their reaction before they actually give it to you. Mm, it depends, because sometimes maybe they're just in shock. And they just don't know how to react. <laughs> <laughs> or, they're, or they're waiting. Or they're waiting to say Jozu. Okay. Yeah. So but if they how... usually people do respond. <laughs> right, right. So uh, so I guess this is how the whole shocking genre came to be then. It's either they get shocked or they get Jozu. There's no, nothing in between. It's just the two options. <laughs> oh, there are many, many shades of Jozu. I mean, there's... Um, <laughs> there's... 
there's oh you, you say one thing and you get jiaozu or you um or they're waiting for the moment to say jiaozu or there's the kind of utter shock or actually you can also get side jiaozu as well um i got that like, they don't even say it to your face they say it to the person next to them like when you walk away <laughs> <laughs> so i was like oh thank you <laughs> um yeah Actually, that's that's quite interesting. I I, I might do that next time because <laughs> it happens. <laughs> the side jaws. It's a new technique. It's a new technique. Yeah, just, they just need to say it, but just not to your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah next time, um, Eric and I are gonna go to Japan, and we're we're gonna start side jawsing people. They won't even know. I'm like, hey, Eric, Eric, that guy at Nihongo Jaws. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just do that at the supermarket. To, oh, to true, true. People. Yeah, we'll pull up to the supermarket yeah. and make yeah. it happen. I mean, if you do that, you're kind of fighting with. I did have a fight with someone on Twitter, and they were talking to me in English. And I was like, oh, it was just this, and I was just like trying <laughs> oh. to respond to them. In, 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 I was talking to them in Japanese because their English wasn't getting through. It was, it was like a controversial topic, and, and you know, these days we have quite a few, and they wouldn't <laughs> respond to me in Japanese. So I just said, it was just this, and then I like, blocked them. <laughs> um, if you do that, you might uh, you might have you know fighting someone depending on how in what mood they're just, in. Yeah, just make sure to block after you jose someone. Just block them. Yeah, and run just away. Just say jose and then yeah, <laughs> you and you just block them. Yeah, it's the ultimate move you can make. That, that's yeah. wild though. You just ended his English career in in one move. Is yeah. amazing. I, I was like, I, I I'm not getting through to you. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna use this this uh, card and run. <laughs> <laughs> you activated my trap card <laughs> <Yes>. on Twitter. <laughs> That's how you do it. That's how you do it. I mean, it's kind of interesting now. Like, are, is there a whole academic sense of the Jozu? Is, is there a study? Is there a field of this? Um, I'm curious. I haven't looked, but I, I, there might be something to do with kind of how you, uh, what's the word? Uh, sometimes uh, English doesn't come out. Uh, uh, when you kind of um, uh, compliment compliment someone, yeah. So when you compliment someone, um, I suppose there is kind of like there's superficial compliments and then there's like real compliments or those kind of compliments you think are real but they're not. There must be something. Um, I'm sure if someone wanted to do their PhD thesis on Jozu, I think it would be okay as like a linguistic thing. Right. Yeah. But I guess kind of getting to your Japanese now. I, I mean, it's pretty interesting. You mentioned that it's your main language, but how long have you kind of been studying it, and what what level would you say you're at right now? Um. So I've been studying since the age of fourteen. So about yeah, fourteen years now. Um, fourteen, fifteen. Um, and yeah, this was the I started studying the age before smartphones and things, and I do have fond memories of sitting in these. Really dodgy chat rooms, um, trying to speak to these random Japanese people, and they were just—it was full of perverts and all kinds of really strange people. But I did—I did learn a lot in these really basic, um, uh, like early, more kind of like yeah, early two thousand style <laughs> chat rooms and stuff. Um, but yeah, uh, it, the the kind of like my my the way I've been learning has changed quite a lot. But um, at the beginning, uh, I was in school, so um, secondary school in the UK. I think it's like middle school uh, for the for the rest of the world, really. I'm not. Sh- I don't really have. There's not really a moment in my life where I was like, I'm gonna learn Japanese. Like this was the thing. But like, I've always been interested in Japan, and I, I, I was really yeah. I was just drawn to the language, and then I started teaching myself, mostly through the internet. I would spend. Hours and hours. My 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 mom started to get a bit worried about me because I would I would just sit at the computer for like hours all day and I'd take things I'd take things to school with me and like doodle and stuff. Um, and then obviously as the internet started to uh, in, like to grow and there were more and more um, resources, I kind of like expanded through that. And is your is your PhD in Japanese? Um. Not for me, not not actually. I I'm not writing my thesis in Japanese for the sole purpose of that. I want it to be read. Uh, if you write in Japanese, a very small amount of people going to read it um, c- compared compared to English. So, um, but I do take classes in Japanese. I do present um, in Japanese. So um, I've done kind of academic um, conferences, like uh, posters, but they've been online, so it's not quite the same. Um, but I do uh, present my research in Japanese and. Um, kind of have 
discussions with people. So I, I'd say my Japanese level is um, I, pre- I pretty much don't have any problem. I, I go and do my taxes and things and try to <laughs> sort out my pension and just just like ask questions. And like, I'm a student and I've been here and I don't know this and I've lost this, but I've got this piece of paper and can you help me and things. So I get I get by um, uh, and I, I do my kind of graduate stuff in Japanese. I did the entrance exam half in Japanese, which is it's kind of a, a weird story. Um, How does that work? Okay. Why would we have? I, I did, yeah. So you, you know, Japan has this like entrance exam um, culture. Yeah. So right. um, it's actually it actually worked really well for me because I did my degree in Japanese studies, but after graduating, I was like, why did I do that? I should have done something else. <laughs> and I was like, okay, masters is the time for me to kind of redeem myself and learn something new, so I can use my my Japanese but also do something kind of more useful. It's kind of the problem with area study degree, area studies degree. And um, I did the entrance exam for masters, uh, which was in English because uh, I was being strategic. If I didn't get in, then I would not get in. Um, but the second, when I, I changed to a different graduate school for my PhD, I had to retake the entrance exam. And if you don't do a like a subject in, if you don't do the subject lower down in education, you, if you pass the entrance exam, usually they're okay with you like to like it depends depends on the professor but usually they're like you can you can come you just have to study really hard so um this phd entrance exam uh i asked the dean of the graduate school and i said um will i be able to do it in english because uh I, I write in cursive it's much faster than writing in hiragana kanji um and he said no it has to be in japanese and i was like okay so i'm gonna spend six months learning a whole cognitive psychology course in Japanese ready for this entrance exam. And I think there, there's this kind of um, exam strategy where you do the easy easy questions first, you leave the difficult one last, so you have the most time to deal with it. And so I started with the easy questions, which are the last questions. And it's like, you have to write some uh, definitions for keywords, so like parts of the brain and um, different statistical methods and stuff. So I did all that in Japanese. And I got to the first question, which is an essay. And it said, you can write in English or Japanese. I was like, oh. Really? Okay, so I, I did the, the, the harder question in English because uh, my visa was on the line at that point. So I needed to, <laughs> I needed to renew my visa. So um, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll do this bit in, in English. So my whoever was marking my paper would start it off with English and it turned to Japanese halfway through. You know? Uh, you know, so yeah, I, I, I always tell people I did, I, did the, right. I did the exam in two languages. Yeah, it sounds like and the ultimate motivator. Yeah, <laughs> your visa is on the line. Your visa's my visa is on, on the line. There's no, there's no time to show off. I'm, I'm not going to write this essay with like all kinds of. I mean, can I can write? I, I was, I was writing to the, to the speed of native speakers. But when you're once again the anxiety when you're in exams, your brain is not working properly. So um, the, the difference between you know uh, how how well my brain is working in the exam hall compared to my dining table, my dining room table very different so um yeah so i did right the dining room table is the place to flex that's where it is it is it is that's where you take all your beautiful notes and stuff but um not in the exam hall but it was if i fell i i would have to teach at a or something and renew <laughs> that way <laughs> uh, we don't want to talk about that it's too that's too real <laughs> yeah too there's scary. always that option yeah. just in case I guess, like, what's been your experience learning other languages? Um, did you find, like, any or easier because you knew Japanese? Or, like, did you have any methods that you use specifically? Yeah, once you've done it once, you start to you start to notice your bad habits. And you're like, oh, I'm not going to do this again. Or this worked for me. Um, after spending so long with Japanese, doing different things, um, having quite a kind of tumultuous journey through my Japanese studies it definitely wasn't 15 years non-stop I did have moments where I ran off to Korean and I always said to <laughs> I always said to a lot of uh, <laughs> friends it always happens it's always Korean um you're kind of like yeah. married to Japanese <laughs> but you kind of have a have an affair with Korean yeah. and it just depends you just That's like <laughs> happening to, happening to me right now <laughs> yeah it's always <laughs> Korean uh, sometimes Mandarin as well but um Korean is a yeah. right so um Particularly languages like Korean, Turkish. Uh, my grandmother is from Turkey, although I can't speak Turkish at all. Um, I tried to learn it, but it has a very similar grammatical structure to Japanese. So um, it's a subject, object, verb, and then the cases are, if you think of them as particles, then it's 
it's all it's very very similar so learning languages with similar grammatical structures is very easy and i've started learning mandarin now but my brain just wants to go to sov even though i'm a native english speaker so when i try to speak in mandarin the verb comes at the end and it shouldn't do in some cases um right. so it, it does kind of prime your your brain to get used to these different grammatical structures um in terms of strategy i realized that i am one of these people who I am more of an immer immersive learner. I do buy textbooks, but I just, although I like to go through them, um, like um, just going through textbooks is more of a, a mental activity and a learning activity for me. The same way you would kind of solve math problems and stuff. It, it has that kind of mental, not gymnastics, but it's kind of, you know, mental training. Um, but I do learn better with uh, immersive learning and also using it the more I use the language, um, I spoke Japanese quite a lot yesterday because um, I've kind of, I don't know, the pandemic here is a bit weird, but um, yeah, I, I managed to speak a lot of Japanese yesterday and I was like, okay, I have to speak in English today. And the more I use it, the more I managed to switch between. So now I'm learning, my, my second main language now is Mandarin. I'm only really focusing on Japanese and Mandarin right now. Um, so I know I that if I use Mandarin, um, I try to use it, I will learn much faster. It will me mean a lot more to me when I'm actually trying to use it. And I think that that is something that I remember from my chat room days. So like these kind of experiences, um, a lot of when you learn the first language, first foreign language, you you get kind of you kind of get a, a kind of taste of everything and you start to realize what works for you. And uh, you change throughout like me as a 15, 16 year old and me now as like, in my late 20s. Um, that things things are very different, and uh, but I still I still have that kind of learning style where I, I prefer immersive stuff, and I prefer using it after a certain um, period of time. Yeah. Right. I'm kind of curious about um, your experience with with Korean because I know like um, the structure is similar, and like since you're already like really fluent in Japanese, do you feel like you were able to progress really fast uh, with Korean? Yeah, when I first started learning it, so I think I had my first Korean, my own Korean wave when I was in high school. It was two years after I started learning Japanese, and that was when the JLPT changed to the kind of N system. And I tried to do N2, but I was practicing with only the old Nikyu stuff, and I failed. And that was it. I was like, I'm done with Japanese forever. I was like, what, 16, <laughs> 17? I was like, never, ever doing it again. I'm going to Korean. So I ran off to Korean for a bit. It's very similar, and like the beginning part, I went through all the basics very, very quickly because it is almost the same. Um, the difficult thing about learning Korean with Japanese is you start to sound Japanese when you speak Korean and not just like pronunciation wise, but kind of um, uh, like choice of vocabulary and kind of phrasing as well. So in Japanese, you can end things with nani nani kiddo. And if you always end things with nani, like momo nunde in Korean, they're like, well, that so doesn't sound doesn't sound very good and I've talked people have told me that you can't always end things with in there and um, mm. yeah it, they, they're so similar that sometimes it's really hard to kind of separate them yeah right but you do progress very quickly and you see um, like I know Japanese people who have they started learning Korean and they've got to topic six in a year um, oh wow yeah and that has a writing part what, as well Wait, what does that mean? Topic six. It's like the t it's the highest level in the Korean proficiency exam. Oh, I didn't know they had that. Yeah, there's two. There's a KLPT which no one does, and then there's. Well, topic there's a KLPT. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I guess I need to take that now. But the, the main one is <laughs> one topic. One year. It's uh, T O uh, T O P I K. Yeah. Okay. And I I've seen Japanese peers learn the whole up the, from level one is really amazing. Level six is is quite advanced. And they've done the whole thing in one year because the vocabulary is very similar. The kanji right. uh, pronunciations entered Korea and Japan around the similar time. So the pronunciation is very similar. The grammar is very similar. Um, and yeah, so it's just amazing how quickly they can they can learn. And if you're quite proficient in Japanese, you can learn that, that quickly as well. If you if you do all the right things. All right. All right. Shh, don't tell Japanese. Don't tell Japanese. We... <laughs> yeah. yeah. But... That was the first Korean yeah. wave. I had a t I had two. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Er Eric and I might potentially be in a Korean wave of, ourself, of our own yeah. right now. 
I'm gonna speed run through the topic six. Just learn about that. Just gonna pass that in a year, <laughs> and then interview myself. <laughs> the <podcast>. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I've also met people who like passed the.、Um, Like JLPT N one, like、uh, Mandarin native Mandarin、yeah. speakers in like a year.、Too. Yeah. So I think Mandarin and there's like similarities there too. Yeah, yeah. Particularly with kanji knowledge, I did meet someone who I think he did it in six months or something. He was a、oh, native、wow. Chinese、yeah. speaker from mainland China,、uh, but he couldn't speak Japanese. Oh yeah, yeah usually. Yeah, usually <laughs> yeah. But I've rarely met、um, like Japanese people who are learning Chinese that got like get to a like a decent high level. So I feel like it's it might not be a bidirectional thing. It's a、sure. one-way thing. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I've seen Japanese people who have got to HSK six quite quickly,、um, but I'm not sure、mm. if it's a year. Maybe、um, there is a, there is that similarity as well, but it's obviously not as similar as Japanese and Korean. Yeah, I mean, I have some question about like the it's like wait from when we first started talking about like the anxiety thing、um, that we can talk about, but like I remember reading. In a book talking about how,、um, like, the brain can remain plastic if it's under a lot of stress and anxiety. So, for example, like moving to a new country, the brain might become more plastic, and that's how like people can acquire, like, that's a catalyst for people to acquire a new language. Like, do you have any thoughts about、um, that? I I haven't read that, so I can't give an academic opinion on this. But from my own experience,、um, I feel like maybe because you're kind of in survival mode, so it's adaptive for your brain to start absorbing the language, the culture, mannerisms.、Um, I did spend two months in Korea during the second Korean wave, and that was when I it was in pure survival mode because I was staying.、Um, the first part was a teaching thing. The second part, second month was a homestay, and I, my Korean got very good. And I think. The there is that kind of survival mode. It's adaptive to be、um, able to pick up the language.、Um, also, I think if you're in that in that kind of environment anyway, you really have no choice but to to speak in in that language. So it is that kind of forced immersion、right. um, setting as well.、Uh, so yeah, it's quite interesting. I wonder because obviously the bla- the brain is plastic. The plasticity of the brain is is something that's with you until old age.、Um, it just slows down、mm-hmm. a little bit. Yeah, because in that sense, like anxiety is, like p- potentially like beneficial. Because、mm. like also just from my personal experience, like it was so different when I was just immersing and watching something and being like no pressure, versus like when I was talking to people and like I had to understand them or else to be like socially, like weird or something like that. And it, I feel like it just accelerated how fast my my brain like picked up the language. Yeah, there is that motivation, and there's also.、Um... Some anxiety can be useful. It can be very motivating, and it's also it's quite dynamic. So you start very anxious, and then you you kind of、um, get less anxious as as it goes on. And、um, when you your your parts of your brain that work with、um, kind of、um, deciding, planning,、uh, executing different activities,、um, they they they're actually kind of linked to the part of your brain which is associated with fear as well. And when you you Probably think back to something and think, "Oh, that was really scary," but I remember it so vividly. Like when a, a huntsman spider got in my shared house and I was living by myself, <laughs> I would never forget this. This was in Japan,、um, <laughs> and、uh, I would never forget that spider.、Um, I was terrified because <laughs> memories <laughs> and emotion are so they're, they're linked,、um, and I think maybe that that is the kind of anxiety, kind of that, that adrenaline rush, that kind of stressful response、right. actually does heighten your ability to remember and learn things. Because it's adaptive as well, yeah. <laughs> that, that's my that's、right. my hypothesis, but I, I I haven't read any papers, so this is this is just me、uh, making things up. Right. Maybe what Eric and I need to do is to maybe for Korean we'll, we'll go get through some basics. Maybe we'll do a Duolingo run just for the sake of、and、doing maybe, that. Maybe we need to just just be in Korea. Yeah. Exactly. And, yeah. And just, just not use、there. any native language. Yeah. Go. Like, go even to me Korea, talking、yeah. to you, Raza. <laughs> yeah, the Kodak on a podcast will be in Korean. Korean for a period of like a month or so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we have to change it from Kodak on a podcast to Egypt or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what it would be? <laughs> I,、uh, I think so. Yeah, you get Egypt or from now or something like that.、Um, yeah, you have to go to Korea and go to like a Jinju Bang or something like steam rooms and just talk to people in there. <laughs> Is that、yeah. the Korean equivalent of the Japanese supermarket? <laughs> oh well, I mean the supermarkets as well are really nice. So、uh, there are plenty of people there. 
<laughs> yeah. Just stand, just stand with the the person who gives out the free the free tasters and, and stop and don't leave. <laughs> looks like looks like we got a plan nailed out ahead of us, Eric. Yeah. We got the whole step by step process. Thanks, Becky. We're we're gonna be on it. Uh, yeah. But again, don't tell Japan. Uh, don't tell Japanese. Don't tell Japanese. Shh. It's a secret. 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 <laughs> but I think I think it's that time, Becky. I think it's just that time. It's calling the one and only message that everyone has been waiting to hear and the one that i know since you started learning japanese way back when <laughs> you wanted to go and say this quote i got a message and i know it's been a while you've been kind of processing and kind of com- coming up with the perfect message for the listeners and i'm here to put you on the spot becky what is your quote i got a message to mm. the viewers the quote i got a squad so um I, I guess everyone listening and watching this podcast are learners of any language, particularly Japanese. And the thing I wanted to say from my own experience, I don't have kind of、um, any kind of, well, I mean, I'm doing a PhD in Japan, so people are probably like, wow. But one thing I wanted to say is that your learning journey isn't always going to be、um, linear. And as I've mentioned with my, my two Korean waves and failing the Dale PT2、uh, um, at the, the right place. Young age of 17. <laughs> and I was very sad. <laughs> I was very sad.、Um, is that it's not always linear、um, and everybody's journey is different. So if you stop making progress or something happens, that's life. And not everybody can spend, you know, like if you have what eight hours to sleep and you've got 16 hours left,、um, say you're spending more, maybe like 14 hours a day. You don't ha- you, it's not possible for everybody. And sometimes you do, you do regress and sometimes you make lots of progress. And even if it's not a straight line, even if it's kind of like a really strange, curvy line,、um, that's still progress over time.、Um, so it's okay to take breaks and it's okay to quit for a bit and change.、Um, it's a good refresh. And、um, yeah, I think it just like enjoy the journey. It's a journey. You should trust the journey as long as you do something every day.、Um, trust it. And yeah.、Uh, Straight lines are uncool anyway. Like, <laughs> 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 you love to hear it. You love to hear it. Hey guys, thanks for making it to the end of the podcast. Comment down below if you would want to learn a different language as well. But gotta quickly thank our patrons. Eric said it. We gotta go thank the patrons. You know what time it is. We gotta thank Cedric, Rory, Faraz, Kevin, Alan, Drew, Jack, Jeanette, Joey, Cage, Nighty, Meredith, MKSXN, Nathan, Polars, Yui, Jack, Sad Boy, <laughs> Rippers, Japan, and Quaid.